Well, hello, everybody. Okay, take your Bible out if you would. And we're going to look at an Old Testament psalm. Got 36 verses in it. And I want y'all to memorize half of every other verse. I want y'all to memorize half of every verse. And you're saying that is not possible. And I want to tell you that most of you in here tonight will have memorized half of this 36 verses in this scripture. And I'm not saying it's going to be verses 1 through 15 or so, and I'm not saying it's going to be verses 16 through the rest of the chapter. I'm going to tell you it's going to be half of most all the verses. So y'all just be ready in just a minute when we get there. But what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about love. Now, we're, we, I usually when I talk about love, I come from the New Testament because of, uh, there's a beautiful understanding of what that love looks like. But I thought it would be a good thing because this was my personal time in the Lord. When I, I read at least one psalm, probably four or five psalms every day, but I read at least one. And this was one of the ones that I read, and I just really wanted to jump off from it. But uh, much of what God does, and I, I, I had to stop just a little bit short of saying every Everything that God does, love uh, does He does out of love, and I think that's the truth. But I couldn't prove it yet. So much of what God does flows from His steadfast love for His people, and God has a deep abiding love for His people that is not extended to the whole of creation. Did you hear what I just said? God has a deep abiding love for His creation. God has a deep abiding love for you and me as His children that He does not extend to every single human being that has ever lived. Yet, God does love every single human being that has ever lived. God does have a love for every person in the world. That's why John 3.16 says, For God did what? So loved who? The world. So that means he loves everybody in the world. But his love is not exactly the same. And it's a little easier to see that in the Old Testament than it is to see this in the New Testament. Well, we find out that God, God does have love for the world, but that that love does not prevent him from pouring out his wrath on those who are under the umbrella that he has. It fits on love for everyone. But there is a steadfast love. So would everybody please say steadfast love? Steadfast. I'm, I'm going to tell you that there's a difference between God's steadfast love and when God just uses the word love. Is there a diff Do y'all use the word love in different ways in your language that you have? How many of y'all love ice cream? Uh, and how many of you love your children? Depends on what day of the week it is. Uh, yeah, but... Uh, but do you love your children the same way that you love strawberry ice cream? You know, but we say that all the time. And we do have a love. We have a love for our spouse. We have a love for different things. But not all, can we say that not all love is equal? All right. But even, even parents have children and you love your children. And then the kids always want to say that mom and daddy love me best. Or they'll say... Mom and dad love so-and-so the best. Okay? But even we'll have to agree that the love that we have for our children is different depending on who the child is. It's both a deep-seated, abiding love. But with God's love, this steadfast love is a little bit different than God's just love for something. There is a steadfast love that God has for the particular people that He is going to call to Himself and who are going to respond to His call and enter that personal relationship with Him. So tonight what I want to do is I want to look at a phrase that's found in the Old Testament. And that phrase in the Old Testament is going to be called, is going to sound like this in the verse we got tonight. It's going to be the steadfast love of the Lord. The steadfast love of the Lord. Now you're going to find steadfast love. If you were to go and do a Bible search in the Old Testament, the Old Testament only, you would find that steadfast love of God is mentioned 196 times in the Old Testament alone. Now the verse of scripture we're going to read tonight is going to contain the steadfast love of God 26 times 
in this one psalm that we're going to look at. So having said that, I want you to see if you can memorize half of this scripture that we have right here. And I'll be shocked if you don't memorize half of it. But read with me. You, you read silently as I read out loud. Give thanks for the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of God. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lord. For his steadfast love endures forever. Y'all getting started to think that God's steadfast love endures forever? All right. To him who alone does great wonders for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made known the heavens for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights for his steadfast love endures forever. To the sun to rule over the day for his steadfast love endures forever. To the moon and the stars to rule over the night for his, y'all help me. Steadfast love endures forever. How many of y'all actually had to look at the text to remember that now? All right? Verse 10. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for his steadfast love endures forever. And he brought Israel out from among them, for his steadfast love endures forever. By the way, if I were to ask you the question at this juncture tonight, why did God bring Israel out from among the Egyptians? You get, okay, you got the point of the whole psalm. It's God's love that's the motivation for everything. Verse 12, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. To him who uh, divided the Red Sea in two, for the steadfast love of the Lord endures and made Israel pass through the midst of it, for the steadfast love endures forever. But withdrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea and overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his love endures forever. So why in the world did God let Pharaoh's army be covered up by the water? All right, y'all have got it. You got it. Okay, verse 16. To him who led the people through the wilderness for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down uh, great kings for his steadfast love endures forever. And killed mighty kings for his steadfast love endures forever. Shy and king of the Amorites for his steadfast love endured forever. And why did he kill uh, Og, the king of Bashan, the guy whose feet were hanging off the bed? For his steadfast love endured forever. And gave their lands as an inheritance for his steadfast love endures forever. A heritage to the Lord his servant for his steadfast love endures forever. It is he who re remembers us in our low estate for his steadfast love endures forever and rescued us from our foes. Why? For his steadfast love endures forever. He who gives food to all flesh for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. So how many of y'all memorized about half of that passage? For his steadfast love endures forever. See, now you just memorized at least 15 verses worth of scripture right there if we, if we, if we count it that way. So you know you got more scripture memorized than you thought. I just want to take a few minutes and look at some of the things, and this is not an exhaustive list, but what this is is about six things that the Bible teaches us or that the Old Testament teaches us about the steadfast love of God. Here's the first one. The Lord is faithful because of His steadfast love. Now, I read a book 30, 25 years ago or maybe even 30 years ago before I went into the ministry. And the, the premise of the book had to do with our love meter that we had for other people. And the, the premise of their book was our heart was like, a, uh, 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 was like a safety deposit box in the bank. If you put some money in the box in the bank and you wanted to go back and take the money out, there would be something in there to take out. So what this guy's recommendation was that if we want people to love us, we have to invest love into their lives so that they will love us. And that sounded like some good stuff, but that is not how God's love works. 
God's love is not dependent on the fact that we love Him. What He does and how He feels about us and the actions that He takes in us have to do with who He is. And after all, God is what? He's love. That's, that, that's one of, it's not just an attribute. It is who He is. So the Lord's, uh, the Lord's uh, is faithful because of His steadfast love. You could go to Psalm 105 and read almost exactly those words verbatim. The second thing I think we can say about it is believers are saved for the sake of His love. Now one of the rude awakenings in my life was coming to the realization that I wasn't saved because of what I did, because if I did what I did to get saved, then I did something to get saved. And if I did something to get saved, I had to work for my salvation. So therefore salvation was not by grace, it was by what? work. It was what, what I did. Okay. So God somehow opens up our minds. We absolutely do choose Him, but it's Him at work in us that causes us to do the choosing. Okay. But we find out in Scripture that turn, O Lord, deliver, me, deliver my life. And then what does the text say right here in verse 4 of, verse, of chapter 6 verse 4? It says, save me for the sake of your steadfast love. Amen. Not because I'm good enough to accept you as my Lord and Savior, but save me because you are who you are and because you have that kind of love for me. <laughs> Blows the top of my brain off when I start to comprehend this stuff. The third one I want us to look at tonight is wise believers ponder the steadfast love of God. Because I have found in my life, the more you try to figure out why God really does love you, the deeper you see God's love for you. Okay, Psalm 107 verse 43 said, Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Okay, I'm going to guess that my Wednesday night crowd is going to know exactly what I'm talking about. When you get saved you got this list of sins that you know of. And you say, you say, I'll confess those sins before God, and you want me to, God, wash those sins away. And maybe you repeated them all. Maybe you just did a general thing. But you said, God, forgive me of sins. And God whooshed in. He saved you. The Holy Spirit cleanses you. You've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And for a few days, you zip around on a high because you know that God has forgiven you of your sins. So then you start, since God loves you, it kind of causes you to love Him. And since you love Him, you go to His Word and you start studying His Word. So you study His Word now for five years. And after studying His Word for five years, did you find out that you had more sins than you thought you had? All right, but when you study the Word for ten years, surely you find out that you've got less sins now, right? Or what do you find out? you got more sins. So what if you studied the, the Word of God for 45 years? What do you find out about yourself? Woe is me. I am a wretched, I'm a wretched, wretched sinner. You can, you can often tell where somebody's relationship with God is by how they describe themselves in, 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 in the stance of God. If I am a wretched sinner, then they've been studying their scriptures long enough to know that if everything was exposed, that if everybody knew everything that God knows about me, I would be a terrible, wretched sinner. Right? That's exactly where God wants us to be. Because where sin abounds, well, uh, y'all have read the same book I have. Grace abounds. So the more God's love exposes to me that I have sin in my life, the more I realize God must love me because he surely does not love me because I'm not a sinner. He loves me in spite of the hundred million sins that I have in my life. So all of a sudden, the depth, the height, the breadth, the width of God's love is being made known to us that this steadfast love for us exists and we can only compare it to the opposite. Sinfulness, love, God's, God's love for us and then we see the grace, the amount of sheer enormous amount of grace that it takes just to keep us in this loving relationship with God. So now this love that we have for God begins to motivate us and say, 
I don't want to be the wretched wretch that I am. So you keep trying to, to, to let the, the Word of God cleanse you and you come to the realization that it's God's grace in you that causes you to be able to become who you can become. He's given you all the grace you need to do whatever it is you've got to do. We have a tendency to hold some of that stuff back and try to step and convince ourselves we can't do it, but the, but the Holy Spirit can overcome anything that is in us and great God's grace has filled us. We grow in grace because we grow in the knowledge of that grace. But all the grace we're ever going to get comes to us at the moment that we come to know Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. So wise believers start pondering on things like that. And as we ponder things like that, it, it really exposes why the Bible says that God is love. Because every time we slip and fall, we get to a point where we know that God is not going to separate us from Himself, but that He's going to continue to love us. Here's a, uh, here's a fourth thing we see in that steadfast love. His steadfast love is absolutely eternal. If you didn't read Psalm 139 and get that God's love is, is eternal, it's going to last forever, uh, go back and read it 72 more times and then see if that helps. But it, it says in Scripture, Psalm 107, 43, and we can find this all over the place. Well, no, no, the next, the next text, I'm sorry. Uh, Lamentations. Here's, here's a lamentation verse. His steadfast love is eternal. So we'll go to the next slide. We'll see his steadfast love is eternal. And if you look in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22, you're going to find that it says right there, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Does anybody in here have an inkling of what maybe verse 23 has to say? Okay, no, no, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't. I, I, did, I, guess I, did, I did make it sound like I was going to do that. But here, here's what the next verse says in there. It says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, but then it's going to come back and it's going to say, His mercies are new every day. The most famous verse in the book of Lamentations. So what God wants us to know and there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, neither depth nor height nor principalities or demons. Are you starting to see why Paul knew what he knew? By the way, do you think Paul knew the Old Testament? I know he did. That's why the Holy Spirit could open up his eyes to see what he could see, say, to say what he could say in the New Testament. Because he was getting this, that no matter what he did, God loved him. After all, if God could love the very man that stoned Stephen to death or held the coats for the people that stoned Stephen to death or they could go around from town to town rounding up people so that they could kill him, uh, God's love must, must, you know, must be eternal. The fifth, here's a fifth one. Our trust in God is actually rooted in this love. Psalm 32.10 Steadfast love surrounds the one who does what? Okay, so there's a relationship between the steadfast love of God and trust. Now, do we increase God's love for us by trusting Him more? And the answer to that question is no. So what is the relationship between this thing? The relationship between this thing is, is when we can comprehend some of the depth, the, bright, the breadth, and the height, and the width of God's love, guess what we start doing in every situation we get into? We trust God in every situation we're in. So that's why the steadfast, the, the steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts God. Steadfast love is there for everybody. It's, it's called according to His purposes. But the reality is we trust because we get it. And we know that we can trust God in whatever we're facing on this day. Here's a sixth one. Got two more and we'll, and we'll quit. The wondrous works of God flow from His steadfast love. And I think you can really see that in the psalm that we read a while ago. You know, why did God part the Red Sea? If I ask that to the average church member and say, why did God part the Red Sea? They would say so that Israel could get across to the other side, right? Isn't that the logical conclusion? That God... But after you've read that psalm, why would you say that God parted the Red Sea? Because His steadfast love endures forever. He didn't part the sea just so they could get across to the other side. He parted the sea because He loved them. He parted the sea 
and he caused all of these other things to happen because he loved him. And the reason he caused the flood to come over the top of the Egyptians and the army and everything is because he loved these in a different way than he loved the general world who got washed away in the flood. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to, his, to the children of men. Why does God do, why, why did God demonstrate to me his love by sending Jesus Christ on the cross? Because God is love. So we can get that. Right? The depth, the breadth, the, the breadth, and the height, and the width of this. And then here's the last one, and there's many, many more, but just the last one we'll look at tonight. The paths of God. The way that God wants you and I to walk. The paths of God's people are laid by the steadfast love of God. God is not going to call us to walk in a path that would demonstrate that he did not love us. Our paths are going to lead us in a direction that proves to us that God does love us. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. So everything we're going to do, we're going to do because he loves us. Now, how did, how did Paul say that? In Romans chapter 8. All things work together for good for those who, who love God and are called according to His purposes. You see the connection back together with the love? Because it's always been all about the love. Okay. So this is where I want to I hope that our brains can get to. Because we're studying... We're studying the book of Ecclesiastes. And what did I tell you in the end of Ecclesiastes? It's going to, at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, when, when uh, Solomon says, let's sum it all up and say it in one sentence, you should fear God and keep His commandments. Now, for years and years, I couldn't understand why in the world God wanted me to fear Him. All right? If He loves me that much, why does He want me to fear Him? Now, if I was four years old, I would understand that God, that my daddy wanted me to fear his 36 belt that he kept wrapped around his waist because I needed that when I was four years old. But I didn't need that when I was 35 years old. There was a different relationship between me and him. So does God really want me to fear him? Well, yeah, but I think the definition of fear changes from the time I'm four to the time I'm 62 years old stand before Almighty God. Because our relationship is not the same thing that it was 60, 58 years ago, if I got my right math right. So here's, here's what I say. We are called to fear God. And we are to do, we, we, and when we do, that fear drives us to the Word of God. Because God scared me so much as a young man and I was afraid he was going to zap me for not getting things right. It drove me to the Word of God because I wanted to get things right so he wouldn't zap me. Is anybody else who would admit, would admit that there was some type of thought in your head that was that way? Uh, it, it is for me. Anyway, okay. So I go and I dive into the Word. So hey, we are called to fear God. And when we do, that fear drives us to the Word. And then the Holy Spirit turns the fear of the Lord into an understanding of God's love for us. And the fear is replaced with love. All right. Now at 62, I love God in a different way than I love God at 11 or 12 years old when I got saved. Would you agree that your love for God has changed over the last 20 years? Now, is it because God's love changed? No, it's not. It's your understanding of God's love that changed. Where did that understanding come? The work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, along with the circumstances that have happened in your life to bring you to where you are, which is only then can we understand one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And this is in the top 10. 1 John 4.18 There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. 
For fear has to do with punishment. Okay, I was scared God was going to zap me. All right. So now my fear has been turned into love. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. But when we can get the depth, the breadth, the height, and the width of God's love for us, God is totally happy with us loving Him instead of fearing Him. But we can't tell the ones who are four years old just to love God and not fear Him because they hadn't been through all the stuff that we gray-headed old people have been through to get there. You start off with fear and you wind up with love. And it's all because of God's amazing grace. Lord God in heaven, thank you for the love that you have for us. Thank you that your steadfast love endures forever. And it does not depend on my performance, but that steadfast love that you have for me will motivate me to become the holy people, holy person that you intend for me to be. Lord, may your people see that that is what love does. But more than that, God, may they get what it means when you say you are love and that your steadfast love endures through everything. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.